Hey all, good morning and welcome to another episode of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, a podcast for small business owners by small business owners to help them learn the tips and strategies to grow their business successfully to the next level. I am excited today to talk to our most recent guest, Jessie Ace, and she's the host of the Disabled to Enabled podcast. It's a podcast that aims to inspire people living with chronic illness. She's interviewed everyone from Paralympians, radio DJs, chronic illness bloggers, and marathon runners. She's also a blog writer and illustrator for the biggest MS charities worldwide, such as the National MS Society, the MS Society, Shift MS, MS UK, amongst others. And she's also written and illustrated for the biggest MS magazines, such as Momentum Magazine, MS Matters, and New Pathways. Jessie was diagnosed with MS at 22 years old and says MS makes her feel blessed every day to be able to live a new life and to connect with so many amazing people. Her own experience of being diagnosed so young was negative and scary. She wants to change this for the other young people and support them through the process of being a patient advocate. That's fantastic, Jesse, and welcome so much to the call today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's amazing. I I am really, really, really excited to have you on the show and to talk to you about your experiences and your thoughts and strategies for as we were saying just before we got online, neither one of us felt like working today. (laughs) 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 But we're both here and we're both going to have an amazing call today. And we need to realize that there are some times when just because we don't feel all right doesn't mean we can give in. And other times it's okay. So let's start out with that. Tell me a little bit about that. (laughs) Okay. Um, So, okay. So I've, I've kind of mastered this, this thing because uh, sometimes, so having multiple sclerosis is really unpredictable. Sometimes you can wake up and feel like you ran three marathons in your sleep. And sometimes you can feel kind of okay, but it's never like, Oh, I feel amazing today. So to counteract that, I, I schedule so, so much of, of what I do. And that has been an absolute blessing. So on the days that I don't feel like working, it's actually all scheduled ready. So actually, if I don't feel like I can do it, then I can actually have that time and I can stop, which has been an absolute blessing. I cannot tell you how much of a blessing that is. <laughs> you just got to be organized and on it on the days that you can be on it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Let's dig a little bit more into that because yeah, I sure. I know for me, that's a that's a really big thing. If yeah. I have it on my calendar, I do it. It's yeah, sort of exactly. an it's sort of an accountability thing for me. And mm-hmm. you know, if, if it's there, I've made a commitment to yeah. somebody, whether it's just myself or whether it's you or someone else. And you know, if it's there, I do it. And yeah. and I think that that scheduling and that putting it down mm. is so important oh it so is if I don't have anything scheduled for the next day then I just fall to pieces when I wake up there's like there's no structure there or anything and then my brain just goes to mush because it's like it's got no structure it's got no nothing to focus on so having a calendar however kind of daunting it looks when it's quite full um <laughs> it actually is a lifesaver and I, I even scheduling things like lunch and breakfast because I forget I forget to take my tablets so it's all in the calendar so I get a little reminder every so often it's like oh you need to do this I'm like oh yeah okay (laughs) otherwise it's just completely forgotten What, what do you use as a calendar so I use google calendar um which is amazing because it doesn't matter what device you're on you can still access it 
So things like a paper diary and stuff for me was awful because I'd leave it in my bag, which was the other side of the room. And then I'd have to get up and use energy. And so if I can access my calendar from whatever device I'm using from my phone or tablet or laptop, then it's just so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I use too. And another thing that helps me is that I've got everything color coded. So if it's yeah. a doc, you know, if it's a doctor's appointment, it's one color. If it's a podcast, it's a different color yeah. so that I can just look at my calendar and go, Oh, I see what's going on today. Yes. And not only that, but you know how you can see how much time you're spending on each thing as well. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think. Yeah. And I think the other thing, because as I said, I use Google Calendar as well, and it's on, I have two different laptops, depending on where I'm sitting in my office or in my house. <laughs> yeah. I have a desktop, I have a tablet, I have two cell phones, you know, because of different things that I'm doing and, and trying to keep myself organized. And mm -hmm. Google Calendar works across all of them. I have my husband's schedule mixed in with all yeah. of that. Yeah. But if I also didn't have things that allowed me to automate that calendar, I would forget to put them in the calendar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Totally. I mean, it's even like um, setting things up for podcasts and things. So when I reach out to a guest, I'll send them a Calendly link. The Calendly link is integrated with Zoom. So that automatically books in that. And then that automatically sends out reminders to the guests, reminders to me. And it's just fabulous. I love it. I love yeah. automatic. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do too, and I use Acuity, which is is wow. similar to to Calendly, but it's so nice because it also sends out invoices. It Ooh, it does, I, yeah, it does everything for me. And when somebody clicks on one of my, I have all these different links for all these things that I'm doing, and and if it's a link where they have to pay me for something. It's, mm -hmm. It sends them out an invoice. It collects the money for me. It's, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And it's wonderful. And I don't think, unless you're using the free version of Calendly, I don't think it's that much more expensive than, than any others. I think I pay like 10 bucks a month for it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And that's a really small price to pay for how much time and energy it saves. So. Yeah, it well, does. What else do you automate? I know that was what we were some of what we were going to talk about today is getting all yeah. of this stuff automated and why do we do it how do you do it um so i use buffer a lot um which is a social media scheduling tool so you can literally schedule all your posts in one go and it will just send it out for you it's amazing it's so good so so there's that aspect and then there's something else that i'm starting to do um so i've recently started on patreon so mm -hmm. you get to um bit.ly slash enabled hero you can see my patreon page and i've basically got a 15 dollar a month package that sends out a postcard with my illustration on uh, every month and it's like a handwritten note on the back and um that's all automated amazing that's very cool i know about patreon but i didn't know that's what it you know i know it's a way that you can actually monetize your podcast but i didn't yeah. realize that's what it did that's very cool i ha so, i'm gonna have to yeah. check into that one Absolutely, yeah. yeah so to set that up i literally um set up the, the tier on patreon and then that goes to that uses something called zapier to integrate it mm -hmm. into um this thing called thanks to io so it'll collect all the details into a google sheet and then use that to go into thanks to io and then they will automate the um, the message on the, on the postcard and then they'll send out the postcard for me. So I literally don't have to do anything. That's, that's fantastic. And I was just going <laughs> to ask you if you'd ever heard of um, either, I think it's I F F F T or the one you just mentioned, which I can't, it's gone right out of my head right now, the name of, but those are two wonderful ways of automating things. Let's talk about them a little oh, bit awesome. more. Yeah. I'll have to, have to look into those ones. They, they sound good. What's the what is the one that you just mentioned? It went right out of my head. Um, so it's something called Thanks.io. No, um, uh, Zapier is what I was Zapier. thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That literally can link any program to any program, so it's really cool. So I use Messenger bots a lot as well um, on Facebook primarily. I'm starting to use Instagram a little bit. Um, but on Facebook Messenger, you can literally use a Messenger bot that can integrate that with 
so many different things. It's amazing. So you can, you can do like a quiz through Facebook Messenger. Um, and then towards the end, you can link it to a Google Sheet where it will collect all the email addresses and phone numbers and things. You can then link that to um, a voicemail drop system where it will send out an automatic uh, voicemail to them. Um, there's just so much you can do. <laughs> really are, are these things difficult? Because I know for me, it's, and I love tinkering and I love finding new bits and pieces of, you know, uh, tools and things. I, I am a geek, but I'm not, my nervous system is like right they're vibrating and if I can't figure something out the computer is likely to go flying across the room yeah and so I go I don't use a lot of this stuff even though I know how wonderful it is because I can't figure it out yeah, yeah totally. I totally get that and I'm I'm not an expert I'll put that out there the, the way that I know how to do this is because um, my husband is um, he calls himself the messenger bot guy <laughs> so he runs a business <laughs> around messenger bots. So he's kind of, so I've done a little bit of work for him and he's taught me how to do a few things and things. Um, but he, his knowledge goes far beyond mine. It really does. So whenever there's a problem, I'm like, Paul, can you come and help me? It's broken again. <laughs> I love it. I, I've actually got a, a Manny chat site and yeah. I've never been able to create a bot ever. Mm. And so I just sort of went, go away <laughs> I don't even want to think of you go away <laughs> but I would love to have one <laughs> I'll help you out with that no worries <laughs> all right that sounds great that sounds great because I, I think it's so important and and this is a conversation that any business person should be having is yeah. what what can we do to, as we get busier in business, what can we do to create an environment where things are done the same every time? You know, mm. they're, they're done so that if we have to be away for something, it still is going to get done and we don't have to worry about it. So it's important to understand all these technologies just as a as a business person in general but I think when we start to look at it from the standpoint of someone who has MS or I have fibro and I have something called complex regional pain syndrome and you know I, we have difficulties on top of the things that just anybody running a business would have yeah totally let's totally. talk about that for a minute <laughs> uh which where do you want to start <laughs> oh just jump in anywhere <laughs> <laughs> i've lost track already see my, <laughs> my <fucking> brain <laughs> Why is it so important for someone that that has um, a chronic illness to to have all of these technologies and strategies? I think it's really important to um, to push yourself to learn new things constantly anyway. Um, and I think I think it's a really wise idea for anybody have, that has a business, not just if you have chronic illness, but anybody. If you're doing something in your business, then I think it's always a really good idea to think about what you would do if you were to pass that on to somebody else. So every system that you create, you're creating it as if somebody else can do it. So that, that way you're building something that's bigger than yourself and it's, you're building something that you're able to then sell and maybe possibly in the future or you're possibly able to outsource everything leaving your time much freer yeah absolutely and there's a and and i'm sure there are lots of other pieces of of technology can do this too but i found a program that i use for a lot of things which goes along with what you're talking about where you can actually train and create other people so that they understand what's going on so if you're not around they can do it and it's a video program called loom it's not zoom like what you're using now yeah. but it's called loom have you ever heard of that 
Yes, you can record your screen and things, can't you? Yeah, if I do it to to train people on different things. I had um, some clients that were trying to figure out how to unfriend people on Facebook, okay. and they could not figure it out. So I just hopped on Loom. I opened up my Facebook page, you know, and I did step by step showing them visually mm. how to do it. And they were then so thankful because they were able to figure it out. And and I think if we can create these handbooks or these guidelines that, you know, will allow us to say, this is what I do. This is how it's set up. This is mm -hmm. the Zapier for it. This is my calendar, exactly. you know, and somebody else can go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Because I know for me, I don't know what I would do without my assistant. I have an absolutely marvelous assistant that I've worked with for a couple of years now. And she does all of this back office stuff for me. And all of a sudden I'll get a message saying, you need to do this. It hasn't been done, <laughs> you know, and, and all these things. So she knows as much about my business, if not more than I do. And a lot of it is because I was able to train her properly in the first place. Do you have anyone that works with you? Uh, currently, no. Currently, it's just me. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, because yeah, I, I think <laughs> that, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> I rely on scheduling at the minute. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think that I mean she she sets up my my robots. She sets up my Zapier. She sets up all of these behind the scene things, and that just if I have somebody that I can rely on to can take over for me, yeah, uh, you know, and do those things, it it just makes me relax. It's a it's a form of joint venture partnering because she's not my employee. She she does work for a lot of other people as well, but she's there and I can rely on her and I know that I can get things done when I need to have things done. We were going to talk a little bit about partnerships and, and those kinds of things. So yeah. talk about that a little bit for me. <laughs> well, I think that's one of the most important uh, things in any business is a strategic, strategic partnership. Um, and I was I was thinking about how I actually got started in the whole kind of started with the whole blogging thing and illustrating thing. And it actually stemmed from one partnership, the very, very first one that I did. So when I first decided that I'd finally accepted my illness it was about four or five years after it actually happened. Um, and I thought. <laughs> okay, I want to change the lives of other people that are like me, that are diagnosed young, that have probably had the same awful diagnosis story that I had. So I was like, well, how, how am I going to do that? And I thought, well, the biggest company that I can think of is the National MS Society in America. So I thought, okay, what? and then I thought, what could I do for them? So I looked on their website, found that they had a blog, and I was like, oh, I could maybe write for them, which was great. And then it literally took about three months of persistent emailing to even get a call with them. <laughs> it took forever. Um, but then after that, I finally got a contract with them to be a blog writer. And then as soon as I told every other company that I was working with them, then they were like, oh, that's a really big company. So yeah, well, sure, we'll, we'll work with you. That's fine. And then it just kind of builds up from there, you know? Um, so the editor for the Momentum magazine, which is one in America, she saw my blogs online on the National MS Society page and she said, um, you know, I want some illustrations for the magazine. So I was like, great, okay. And then that turned into an article for the magazine and then that turned into another article for the magazine and then that turned into an article in England for a magazine. So it's just, it snowballs. As soon as you get in with the biggest people that you can, the biggest influencers that you can, it just snowballs everything else. It really does. Yeah. I um, think I think a lot of it is just having the patience to wait it out. <laughs> oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same with podcasting as well, trying to find, you know, the biggest guests that you can and things and using, so you can utilize their sort of network and leverage and that, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I There's so much that, we can learn and that we can do to grow our businesses. Um, if you 
were looking for clients, what would you be looking for? Clients in what uh, aspect? Because I've got a lot of different channels going on at the minute. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> How do you make your money? <laughs> <laughs> Um, mostly blog writing and illustrating at the moment okay. so I would reach out to the biggest magazines that I could find and I would share my story and I would say look you know I'd like to give this to your audience uh, would that be something that you're interested in and I think the magical line of anything if you're going to reach out to somebody to try and uh, get a result the magical line to say is what's the magical line to say? <laughs> out of my head <laughs> I understand that um, very well <laughs> this is what MS does like it just wipes my brain clean um so the magical line is would it be unreasonable to consider xyz would it be un unreasonable to consider us working together basically okay. so you basically yeah. look for no answer yeah that's yeah, that you know, jumping around. I'm I'm real good at jumping around too with with things. <laughs> and um, I have had, in one way or another, I have had what used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Now is called complex regional pain syndrome. You know, it's not bad enough that you have all the pain and everything. You have to remember all these new names all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, but it was it was probably two years before they finally came up with the decision that that's what I had. They thought I had MS. They thought I had lupus. They thought it was, you know, Lyme disease. You, you go through all of these different tests and doctors and everything under the sun and it's just one of the most frustrating um, discouraging depressing journeys that you can possibly imagine I really wouldn't change it now because I see it I almost see it as a blessing because I would not be where I am today if I hadn't gone through all of that, but exactly. I, I, I was 30. So I wasn't that much older than you when, mm -hmm. when they, when they, you know, first I got hit by a, by a bus in downtown Washington, DC. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's what started the whole thing, you know, but it, but it took, I was in a cast for six months. I was this, I was that, I was the other thing, you know. So talk to us a little bit. We're, we're going off of the subject <laughs> of business per se, but talk to us about what it was like to be diagnosed, what it was like in those first few years of knowing that there's something not quite right mm, well it, it's a really interesting story really because I was a perfectly healthy person one day and then I woke up the next day with the left side of my body completely paralyzed mm. and I was like what <laughs> <laughs> and it was literally on the last day of university so I'd done three years of all this work and you know I'd set up a business in my second year so that I'd have something to go into on my third year. So I had an agent set up. I had a book deal for when I left. I had products in stores all around the country. Everything was ready for when I left uni. I just had to leave uni. And that last day I woke up and I had a paralyzed left side and I was like, oh my God. So those last three years were for nothing pretty much. And I didn't know who I was anymore because I thought, well, art and design is the only thing that I've ever really known um, and illustration was the thing that I really wanted to go into and a few weeks after having the left side paralyzed my right hand also went paralyzed as well so I literally had two hands that didn't work I'd had a degree that's now amounted to nothing and I was like what the heck <laughs> like what is this all about it's ridiculous so me being me um, woke up with a paralyzed left side and I decided to wait a week before going to the doctor because I thought oh it'd be a trap nerve or something it'll be fine it'll be fine because you know when you're 22 you're like young and invincible and like nothing can touch me I'm fine yep. um yeah no it didn't really work that way so not so much <laughs> <laughs> not, not great 
<laughs> so the doctor originally thought I had something called a hemiplegic migraine, which I didn't know what it was, if I was honest. Um, it was basically like a localised weakness in the body or, or something. So I was like, oh, okay, fine. Um, I'd never had a migraine, so I couldn't compare it to anything else. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, and it wasn't until I got home that she actually rang me back and she said, actually, I've just been speaking with my colleague and she said that you could have had a stroke, so you should really go to A&E. And I was like, oh my God, a stroke at 22? Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. But then I kind of thought, well, at least if it's a stroke, then it's, it's over and done with. And, you know, I'll just kind of have to learn to live with this. It's a bit, it's a bit uh, weird but uh I'll just kind of make the best of it it'll be fine and then I got sent to A&E and I had every test under the sun um <laughs> a test that I'd only ever seen in Grey's Anatomy uh, <laughs> which was my favorite show at the time I love Grey's Anatomy um <laughs> so, yeah. and I came out three days later um with my diagnosis and I remember that day so so clearly so the doctor came in to the stroke ward that I was on. I was surrounded by these 80 year old ladies that were shouting and screaming because they'd all got like dementia and Alzheimer's. It's the first time I'd ever been in hospital. So, you know, that was fun. Um, <laughs> my one savior was the guy with the tea trolley that came around every few hours. <laughs> he came around with tea and cake and that was like the best part of the whole thing. Say, this like, oh, this is be- definitely a hospital, not in the United States. <laughs> I never got tea. <laughs> This is an English hospital. We, we have tea and cakes brought around every few hours. <laughs> Man, if I get sick again, I want to get sick in England. <laughs> we do, because the NHS is amazing. Um, so this doctor came in anyway, sat on the end of my bed, kind of pulled the curtain around my bed and was like, look, um, so I think you know, I think, I think we know what it is kind of thing. There's just one more test that we want to do. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, well, what's that then? And he was like, um, so it's this thing called multiple sclerosis. And I was like, okay, um, and what's that exactly? <laughs> I had no idea. I'd never heard of it before. Mm. The thing that came to my mind instantly was a wheelchair. And I, I instantly thought, oh my God, I'm going to be in a wheelchair. This is awful. Um, and I actually realized now that I got it confused with cystic fibrosis, where a person only lives till about 35, like normally. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh my God, I'm possibly going to be in a wheelchair. I've got 10 years left to live. I was perfectly healthy yesterday. What the hell is going on? Mm. Oh my God, my life's over. And he literally said to me, um, the best thing to do now is to go home and Google it in your own time and find out more information about it on your own. And I thought it was perfectly normal at the time, but uh, everybody that I've told since is like, no, they should not say that to you. (laughs) They should give you pamphlets and leaflets and and all Mm. of this. And I was like, Mm. okay. Well, they didn't. They didn't give me anything. So I was literally healthy one minute and then diagnosed with a degenerative condition the next minute with no information whatsoever. And I then had a four month wait between then and when I first met my neurologist. So that was an incredibly scary four months. And I went into severe depression. I didn't even leave the house because I was too scared to go outside. I didn't talk to anybody. My friends stopped talking to me. I lost the book deal. I lost the agent that was wanted to represent me. My work got pulled out of all the shops because I had no hands. I, I couldn't use my hands anymore. So I was yeah. like, oh my God, I, what, what do I do? So yeah, I went into a quite severe depression on that, on that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and I understand because I mean, it, it sounds really like we were on a similar journey, really? except except when I got all of this, nobody ever, the doctors had not, for the most part, the doctors had not even heard of RSD. They did not know what it was. I was told more than once that people that had this problem were given frontal lobotomies because there was nothing really wrong with them. All the tests would all come back negative. They couldn't figure out, you know, so you're ma- you're either making it up or you're sick in the head and, you know, to get you well, we just have to give you a frontal lobotomy. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't Google it because, first of all, there was no such thing as Google back then. <laughs> And, and since the doctors didn't even know what it was, there was nothing written about it. And the same was true. I got fibro a year after I got the RSD. So I'm probably one of the longest living people that has these, you know, 
<laughs> problems. And, you know, they, nobody knows at that time, nobody knows what they are. And they still, I just recently joined a couple of groups on Facebook that are for fibro and RSD. And the doctors are still just, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And we don't know what to do with it. You know, and, and I am now in a wheelchair. I'm, you know, I can't go anywhere without my husband pushing me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so our stories are similar, but you can't just, and for a while I sat there and I was depressed. I didn't leave the house. I didn't anything. And I just thought, I just want to die. I don't want to live like this, yeah, but you absolutely. can't do that. You have to, you have to get up and keep going and you have to make something of your life. And obviously you did too. Do you have use of your hands back now? Yes. Yeah. They came back about six months later. So fantastic. It took a long time, but thank God that they did. In the end. Yeah. 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 Cause I, I, I know I am um, two years ago, Christmas Eve, I was getting out of the shower and my bad leg gave out on me and I went, plump oh, no. down on the ground and landed on my you know how you land and your wrists yeah. are bent and I landed on my hands and knees and immediately my my whole right arm just went numb and oh, all these kinds of things and it was nine o'clock in the morning I didn't go to the emergency room until nine o'clock that night <laughs> You know, and, and the emergency room says, oh, you didn't even sprain it. There's nothing wrong. It took them three weeks to figure out I had broken bones. <laughs> oh, and so really? I can't, yeah, and I tore my rotator cuff at the same time. So I have very little use of my right arm. So mm -hmm. I understand, again, what you're talking about. For a long time, I had to figure out how to use Dragon. Do you know Dragon software? No, I've not used that. Dragon is a piece of software. It's a transcription software. And uh, you t you talk into it and the computer types for you. Oh, and that's cool. it's amazing. It works really well. Although now um, Microsoft has it in their Word package and Google has it as well. And they they really work well. You still have to go in and do some editing with it. But... It, it for somebody who has very little use, I gotta fly. For somebody who has very little use of their arm, you know, and their fingers and their hands, this software is an amazing piece of technology. Oh, that sounds great. I need to try that. <laughs> yeah, it's called Dragon D R A G O N. It's, it's a wonderful piece of software. I love it. So, well, what have we not? talked about that you would like to share with the world oh what a question <laughs> um, what a question indeed gosh um so what what have we talked about already so we've talked about business a little bit um automations uh diagnosis yeah, we, we've talked about partnerships, yes. we've talked about scheduling and keeping on track with things. I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> we have covered a lot, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's only one real rant that I've got in me if you're interested. Absolutely, go <laughs> for it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here we go. All right. So, right, okay. It really drives me crazy um, that the whole disabled thing the whole disabled icon is a wheelchair that really really bugs me <laughs> you may or may not feel the same um but when i was first diagnosed with ms and my ms nurse who i met for the first time was like oh you've now got like disability rights they apply to you and, and all of this sort of stuff and you've got to tell your employer because blah 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 and you're now disabled and you can get a disabled badge and all of this and i was like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disabled. Like I'm perfectly abled. Like I was fine, Like I, I can't really use my hand, but like, that's fine. I'm totally fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a real, real issue being labeled with the whole disabled thing. Hence my podcast disabled to enabled. Um, cause that's kind of how I went. I went from being disabled to enabled. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing that I have a real issue with is the icon of the wheelchair. Um, so whenever I use my blue badge permit, for example, uh, in car parks or whatever, and I use it and I get out of the car and I 
walk away people who don't know anything about chronic illness are like oh my god why are you using your your blue badge when you can walk you're supposed to be in a wheelchair there's a picture of the wheelchair on the space and I'm like no that's not how it works mm -hmm. it really really bugs me so i'm currently <laughs> i've currently partnered with the ms society and an mp from scotland who is um we, we've created this alternative symbol that we want to use for well, on everything basically and it was really funny because I rang up the Department of Work and Transport the other day and I said, yo, why is there a, I didn't actually say yo, I was a bit more professional, but like, just, you know, sound cool. Yo, <laughs> why are you using a disabled, uh, sorry, a, a wheelchair for, for a disabled icon when actually 76% of people with disabilities don't use a wheelchair? This is the thing. And they said, well, you know, blah, 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 and gave me some poor excuses and things. <laughs> and I said, that's not good enough. I said that's not good enough because you're you you need to be inclusive of all, you know, uh, abilities. It's not just one one set of people that you should be catering for, and there is so much discrimination and prejudice that people like me face who have invisible illnesses, who by the general public are just getting constantly, you know, <laughs> shouted at <laughs> essentially in car parks. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so. So yeah, and um, they basically told me that uh, because we're leaving the EU, we don't actually have a leg to stand on at the moment. So I was like, great, okay. <laughs> so they, they pretty much said, well, that's how it is and that's how it's going to stay. And I was like, yeah, no, it's not. Not if I have anything to do with it. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> well, so, sign me up as an advocate for that because I have my own story on that one too. I um. um I had been shopping in a big mall outside of Washington, D.C., where we used to live, and I had gotten back to my car. I was parked in a handicapped spot. I had my handicap tags, and I'm, you know, breathing hard, trying to catch my breath, and I just sort of sat back and closed my eyes to, to get myself oriented again, and here's this bang, bang, bang on my car window. And I kind of woke up and rolled the window down and this woman sticks her head in the car and starts, she's literally nose to nose with me, oh my God. screaming her head off at me. At how dare I park in a handicapped parking spot? Ugh. That's yeah, so rude. And back then I wasn't in a wheelchair. <laughs> I didn't even have a cane. I just was, you know, having a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm going, but, 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 and she just wouldn't even let me get a word in edgewise. And then mm -hmm. ramps around and goes stomping off to the mall. And it was because there weren't any other parking places anywhere around. And she was upset because she had to walk. Mm -hmm. So I understand exactly what you're talking about, you know, is that yeah. it's it's crazy that people, you know, uh, and, and I think that actually leads into a whole nother um, consideration that so many of us, unless you are in a wheelchair or, or something like that, we don't show as having anything wrong. Yeah, exactly. It's like all my symptoms are kind of internal. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. weird. It's really hard to explain to anybody else that doesn't understand. Yeah, you know, I'm not blind. I don't have my my walking, you know, my white cane. I don't have that. So people, you know, people can't see that I'm that I'm I'm not blind. You know, they can't they cannot tell that I am just in horrible, horrible pain, ninety nine point exactly nine percent of the time mm. you know and people can be really uncool you know yeah. with the way they treat other people totally. it's sad and i think it's it's hard as well because i do see it from their point of view because at the end of the day they would see a normal 28 year old woman looks perfectly fine looks perfectly normal and obviously i'm abusing the system <laughs> You know, and I kind of get it from their point of view. They're trying to look out for people with disabilities and handicaps and things or, or whatever. And, you know, I kind of think, yeah, that's great. But I think there needs to be more education for the general public on invisible illnesses and chronic illnesses and just, just yeah, just, just more, more stuff like that. It's just ridiculous. 
Well, I, I think it's time, and hopefully this show will start that knowledge going out there, <laughs> and that we can we can eventually get that education going yes. and let people realize <laughs> that we're not, like you said, we're not disabled. We're enabled. We're other abled. I've you know I've heard a lot of different words, but mm-hmm. I I can still do almost everything. I just have to do it another way. You yeah, know? you still sleep every every half an hour. <laughs> Speaking of, I'm going to go take a nap now. So. <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been fun. It's been educational. It's really, I'm going to talk to you offline about your husband. <laughs> and bots and you know we will we will get this going and lots of people will will learn from it thanks guys for listening today this was a bit of a different show but it's gonna be more along these lines from now on so if you have comments if you have thoughts share this podcast with others it appears on Thursday evenings at 5 p.m. Eastern at www.don'twaittillpigsfly.com. And we would love to have you download it, subscribe to it, send us ideas for, for future chats, and we will talk to you again soon. Until we do talk again, be productive, get out there, and soar higher. Take care, y'all. Bye-bye.